Right, welcome to another Whiskey Circus. Um, today we've got Graham Cool, who's decided to up roots from Bonnie, Scotland, across to Ireland, and make some nice whiskey from the Dingle Distillery. So I'll hand over to you, Graham, if you can give us a quick introduction to exactly who you are, your background, and a little bit about what you're doing now, and then we'll get into some conversation with you. Okay, well, um, I started working in the whiskey industry back in 1994 with uh, that Glenfiddich distillery. I was actually on the bottling side of things there. They bottled all the, the Glenfiddich at that time in Dufftown. Um, that gave me the kind of backdoor entrance into distillation and then I moved across to the Glenfiddich distillation side of things and also inherited Balvenny and Canindy. Uh, about a year later. Uh, so worked there until 2005, then became the distillery manager at Glen Murray in Elgin. Um, so it wasn't, uh, wasn't that far a move, about 20 miles. Uh, and I was at Glen Murray until October last year when I moved across to Dingle Distillery on the southwest coast of Ireland. I mean, one thing that struck me, we, you know, we, we, everybody on the circus kind of knows you from Glen Murray. We, we all appreciate what you were doing. And I think a lot of, obviously, what you started to put together, maybe previous managers and that, it's distillations, but you obviously created the whiskies then. It was kind of a big shock for us to see you going from that kind of distillery to Ireland, never mind anything else, but, you know, to, to Dingle Distillery, which, you know, let's be honest, is, is relatively unknown to most of us. Um, was it a big decision or was it just something that really appealed to you? It, I mean, it, it was a big decision and uh, timing probably was everything. You know, there are certain times in your career when you can <coughs> make moves much easier than, than, than other times. And I, it, just, it just felt like the right job. It, it, when you read the, the job description, it was all the nice parts of the job that, that I do uh, without much of the, the, the kind of mundane parts that you have to do. So mm. it, was, it was just an ideal chance. And, you know, those that don't know Dingle Distillery, it was uh, the first sort of new distillery in Ireland to be built uh, back in tail end of 2012, started distillation. So it's, it's, it's basically a seven year old distillery with maturing stock. So it, it's, for me, that's a really interesting time to, to take on a distillery and, and hopefully, you know, direct it for the next, hopefully, 10 years or so uh, into, you know, into its teens, teenager years and, and really um, make, its, you know, make its mark and uh. compete against the, you know, the, the existing Irish distillers that are, that are already there, you know? Yeah, I mean, obviously... Again, you know, most of us still kind of think of you as, as Mr. Glen Murray, uh, Glen Murray. And, you know, we, we know how much positive things you did with Glen Murray. And we, you know, we all kind of fell in love because of how honest we you were and how you spoke to us all on social media and things like that. But what exactly was it at that point that really intrigued you about Dingle? Because I'm assuming you don't, get to go and have a look at the stocks of whiskey and think, yeah, I can really do something with this. So there's got to be something in there that was just just enough to get you there. <clears throat> yeah, I think you know, we took the trip across to Dingle to see it and with a very open mind, probably looking for reasons not to make the move because it's uh, much easier to stay, stay where you are and much more comfortable to stay where you are sometimes. But, you know, the whole thing about Dingle was an attraction and even though you, you don't know what the stock profile is, you know, to, to a great deal of detail, we were taken into the warehouse and, and you know, even visually you can, you can tell um, what the stock is like, uh, mm. you know, lots, lots of sherry casks, lot, probably about 40% sherry they were filling into, um, also ex-bourbon and port as well and, and some wine casks in there. So, so you could tell that, you know, that seven years worth of stock that was maturing was, was something really worth 
a taking on and, and you could you could you could do something with it you weren't having to work too hard with it so, yeah you know. so uh, have you gone in a similar capacity so are you master distiller master blender or are you overall manager of the distillery now or how does what position have you yeah, officially it, taken it's very similar to glenn murray you know glenn murray i was distillery manager and master distiller yeah. so you know a which was was great because you you were running the whole show um, from the raw materials in to the to the mature spirit out. But with that came, you know, twenty four seven accountability as well. So mm, yeah, it's a, it, it was it could be tough sometimes. You know, getting calls in the middle of the night and uh, and then having to do the day job at the same time. And you know, in my time, Glen Murray increased capacity from two million liters up to six million litres in the, mm. the, the time I was there. So it was a much bigger ship at the end. Uh, and, you know, much of that, the reason for that was it was, uh, we were making mature spirit for, for the blends within La Martini Kez. They have uh, Label 5 and Sir Edwards, but they also um, just purchased uh, Cutty Sark as well, which, you know, is a, is a long-standing blend, which probably has fallen away a little bit. but. But uh, you know they they saw the potential to bring it back. But that was probably one of the things that kind of swayed me to to look uh, to do something else because the, the the focus in the company was definitely going to move more towards blending because they were the important uh -huh. aspect. You know they'd spent a lot of money on Cutty Sark buying stock, buying the name. So the focus was always going to be on that. And and probably you know I just felt maybe Glen Murray was going to it would still tick away as a single malt, but. There was probably more potential there than than you know, but but companies have to prioritise and and you, you, you uh, Lamartini cares they were, their direction was 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 more towards was blends so so the move to Dingle was a chance just to get back to the focus on the, the you know the stuff that I really like doing and you know yeah. that's what the single malt and of course in, in Ireland as well you have this thing called pot still as well which is a is another interesting. A whiskey type, which I'd never never heard of, uh, never knew much about until until I came here. So, what was the harder decision then? Was it the fact of moving distillery, or was it going from Scotland to Ireland? Uh, the hardest decision, I suppose, was was moving to Ireland. The the distance, you know, uh, mm. Dingle. Uh, you can move to Ireland and you can move to Dingle. It's two different things. <laughs> yeah, you know, Dingle yeah. is a is a five-hour drive, four and a half-hour drive from from Dublin, it's right across the country. The nearest airport is is pretty good. It's an hour away, uh, so you do get some links to to the UK from there. But but no, it is quite a remote uh, mm. location. But uh, so that 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 would be the biggest the biggest step. You know, I kind of knew what I was letting myself in for in terms of the job, and I knew yeah. what they what they needed. So that bit was was pretty straightforward. Um, it was just, uh, but but fair play. The move, was, the actual physical move, was was pretty easy. We we moved across. Uh, we came across sort of the day, two days before our our, our stuff arrived. Uh, the stuff arrived and was unloaded in in half a day, and we were in the house. So it was, you know, although we're well, probably twelve hours away from from Elgin, if you if you uh, do a continuous journey. Uh, it was it was pretty smooth and uh, mm. we've, 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 we've found our feet pretty quickly in Dingle. It's a small town. It's only got a population of 2,000 people. But I mean, one of the things that kind of comes up a lot between the Irish and the Scottish is who actually made whiskey first and who is the pioneers and things like that. So I suppose the way you must kind of now look at it is you're a Scottish man coming to teach the Irish how to make whiskey now. Yeah, it's it's always a good wind up, you know. There's a there's a, there's a, you know the the whiskey public in Ireland. There's 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 a lot of fans out there, and they're they're very passionate about what Irish whiskey is and and where it's going. Uh, to the point that they'll they'll probably argue more over here about whiskey than than uh, mm. they will in the UK, which might come as a surprise to you, Soren, you know. But uh, 
Uh, but they, they, they do like a, they do like a bit of a debate over here. And, uh, I, I, I honestly can't work out what you're trying to say there, Graham, because you know I've never known any of the Irish companies be controversial or anything. So we'll maybe leave that for a little bit later. Are you, are you blocked or unblocked at the moment? No, that's well, not. I, I'm pretty I'm pretty devastated that I'm still unblocked. So um, I was hoping I was going to become the first person to be blocked twice, but doesn't seem to be working that way um, but no I mean we, we, we all do know that the Irish generally give everybody a very warm welcome they're a very welcoming community but you know there's got to be a lot of ribbing going on between yourselves and, and your co-workers who are probably Irish that you know it's taken Scot Scotland to come in to show them or you know something like that but um, can you just explain a little bit about Dingle Distillery to those that don't really know much about the distillery then, you know, the, the size, the, the profile and, and what, what they're looking for now you're there? Yeah, so Dingle Distillery, as I said, started 2012, the end of 2012. Our production capacity is 200,000 litres of, of alcohol per year. So, so small, you know, small in terms of, of, of certainly the Scottish setups. Uh, we've got a one ton mash tun, which is made of wood, which is again I've never seen before. Uh, it's uh, pretty unique. Um, five washbacks, so we fill them up to 5,000 litres. And then we've got the three, three stills for the triple distillation. Uh, we're on two shifts a day generally, um, seven days a week. So, so we do run seven days, but no, no night shift just now. Uh, which is great because it means there's no calls in the middle of the night. So it's uh, quite nice to go to your bed and, and realise that the phone's never going to ring, hopefully anyway. Um, so, yeah, and we run pretty much 50 weeks a year. We try and keep going all the time. And, uh, you know, we're still producing an awful lot more spirit than we're selling. We're probably, you know, in bottle equivalents, we're, we're producing around about 400,000 bottles a year. Uh, but we're only, at the moment, selling around 50,000 bottles a year because obviously production wasn't as big mm. in the early, you know, first couple of years. So, so there's a bit to go to, to bridge that gap. It means we're buying in, obviously, pretty much every cask we, we have to buy in to fill. We're not, uh, not emptying too many casks. So, so there's a lot of cask purchasing going on to, to try and uh, you know, get the best out of the stock. Yeah. We make single bottles. Sorry. Sorry. I was just going to say, so how are you finding making the hot still and things like that then? Because obviously that's something you won't have really come across before, so mm -hmm. a single pot yeah. still. For those that don't, don't know what pot still is, um, it's basically where you combine malted barley and, and unmalted cereals, of which most of that must be uh, unmalted barley. You can also throw in other things like rye and, and oats. So basically it becomes a, it's almost like a blend going through the distillery with, with the, the, the malted grain and the unmalted grain. We're roughly 60% malted barley and 40% unmalted in our pot still. So it, what it does, it gives you, it tends to give the whiskey a creamier uh, texture and a bit yes. of spice. So at the younger age, it possibly is a bit more, uh, drinkable at a younger age than, than single malt is. Single malt needs a little bit of time. Um, but in saying that, triple distilled single malt probably picks up the character of the wood a bit quicker than you know than traditional double distilled. So, mm. so you combine all that with the fact that we're filling into first fill casks means that although the whiskey is only six, seven years old just now, it's now it's certainly at an age of, and quality that it can hold its own and, and and compete against you know, older whiskies. Yeah. So, I mean, how are you, are you putting a finishing program in? Because we obviously know that all the Irish people over there like a good finished whiskey. You know, there's, there's no controversy about finishing whiskey neither in Ireland. So, you know, are yeah. you, you did a lot of finishing in Scotland. So is that something you're going to look at in Dingle as well? I'm doing, it, I'm doing a bit of that, you know, Obviously, I've inherited mature stock, which none of which had been finished before. It's all full maturation, and as I say, roughly 40% ex-bourbon, 40% sherry, which 
of that, half of that is PX and half is all also. Mm. Uh, then roughly about 10% port and then, then a mix of, of others, you know, Madeira and wine and some rum casks in there. So it's a nice portfolio, but it, 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 we're getting to the stage where we're running out of permutations for, for releases to make them a little bit different. We're, we're still in a batch release uh, set up just now because we're, the stocks are, are building up. So uh, what I'm trying to do is widen the portfolio of, of casks that we're, we're using. So some of those will be, will be finishes, you know, I brought in a couple of uh, wine, d different wine casks in to, to see how they, they work. And the good thing is I can play with the pot still and the single malt and see how they, they react to it. Um, and the other thing as well, I've made some peated uh, dingle single malt this year as well, which, you know, that's, that's, that, you know, it'll be a few years away before that's, that, that comes out, but time does fly on in, in this whiskey terms. So, so it's, it'll be out before you know it. So where is the where do you get the peat from to do the peated Irish malts? Then is it is it an Irish peat or is it coming from Scotland? It, it, it breaks my heart. I had to go to England for it. Oh, you've come to England for it. <laughs> <laughs> Last chance alone. <laughs> where, where, whereabouts in England have you got the peat from then? Graham? I got it from uh, Muntins. From Muntins, yeah. 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 To understand, uh, there is a bit of peat in Ireland, but not not in big volumes. You mm. know, the, the maltsters will will catch up. I'm sure when when they, well, they'll need to catch up if there's if there's demand there, they'll they'll, they'll meet it. But uh, it was uh, you know a, a little bit tricky to get. If Dingle, we're our, our malt intake at Dingle, we need to blow the the malted barley into the bin. We don't have a you know an intake screw and a, an elevator, so you have to get the right type of lorry to do that um, and obviously our bin storage we've only just got over 30 tons storage so we have to time the delivery to the day as well so it, mm. it's a little bit trickier but fair play to Muntins they got the delivery on the day at the right time to us uh, and it's there they just started doing peated malt as well I think we were one of the first customers of them so uh, it was nice, and you know, I've worked with Pete Robson from from there, uh, uh, back in the Glen Murray as well, and they were good, yeah. good suppliers to us. So, so no, it was nice to, to to work with them again. So I'm assuming then that that flavour profile is probably going to be very similar to a, a mainland Scottish peat rather than your Isla peat, because it will be probably trees and things like that rather than just mosses and and that sort yeah. of breakdown. Yeah, and. You know, it wasn't about making something radically different either. You know, it, the, the difference I did was that the, the peated spirit was double distilled rather than triple. I, right. I, just felt, I just felt we'd lose more character if we if we went triple. I didn't want yeah. to go all that lengths and uh, and come out with something that just didn't have the the oomph that that, that we'd want. You know, because you can you can ease off on the peated character later in, in life by mixing, you know, non-peated and peated together. I think it's still better to to make something as, as you know, with a, a good rich content and then play yeah. tunes with Well, that's kind of what I was going to ask next with, with the peated side then. So you've obviously gone double distillation rather than triple because I suppose, you know, the triple is going to be very light. The peat would have probably really dominated in that sense. But uh, what PPM have you gone to then? We're sitting around 20 ppm in the spirit. It was uh, around about 40 ppm, 40 ppm barley, mm. uh, malted barley. So, so uh, yeah, it's a, hopefully it's a nice, uh, you know, it's, it's, there's certainly enough there, enough character to, to come through. And uh, obviously put it into a com combination of different casks as well uh, to, to see how it works out. Mm. Um, and so, yeah. so how are you finding the difference from obviously going from your double distillation in Scotland to the triple distillation, are you are you finding that it's not working necessarily in some casks, or is it working just as well as double distillation does? I think um, you know what's interesting here is that, that you're watching a, a distillery grow up. So we we don't know what uh, Dingle will taste like at 12 years old. Nobody does. Mm. So it's, it's it's every every year, every day, you're learning something. And 
you know, I, I, as I said before, I think the pot still that we make is, is possibly a little bit further ahead in maturity than the single malt. But I think we're just also at a stage where in the early day, years, the sherry casks were obviously took a head start on, on single malt, but now the bourbon cask is really starting to come into its own. Mm. Uh, probably the sherries maybe need to wait a bit longer again to, to, to peak again. So, so it, yeah, it, 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 it keeps you on your toes because you, mm. it, it, you can't just sit there, throw it in the cask and, and forget about it because you, because you don't know what it's like. You've nothing, you know, at Glen Murray, I could go and get a 12 year old cask or a 15. Yeah, and test and it, yeah. it, Well, that's roughly what we're going to have. So, mm. uh, whereas here, it's very much they uh, suck it and see and, and, and put it away and but, but keep an eye on it, you know. So, yeah, I'm going to say, because I suppose when you look at the industry as a whole for the triple distillation side, there isn't a lot of examples you can go to to look at old stock of triple distilled whiskies. I mean, we know we've got the rose banks that are sort of sitting quietly away, but other than that, it, it's hard to really think of another distillery that have got very old stocks of triple distilled whiskey. So, no, and, and triple distilled is there is no one method for triple distillation. There, there are so many. Mm. ways of doing it you know if you look at some of the like Springbank and and the others uh you know even if it's more click with its two point whatever eight three is it uh distillations yeah. depending on where and how you recycle your your faints back you know mm. you you will create different different spirits altogether so whereas double distillation is a bit more you know, that i know of it's a bit more regimented that you mm. know You've got your low wines, you, you then combine that with four shots and faints and take off a spirit cup and go again. But whereas here, where we go to the, everything goes forward from first distillation into the second distillation. Uh, but then you have things like strong faints and weak faints, which uh, then then either go forward or go backwards in the process. So, so there, yeah, there's a bit more, mm. a bit more I mean, to it. Talking of the cutoffs, um... Jens is asking, what are the cutoff points for the for your normal spirits? I'm assuming he means the triple distilled, your peated spirits, and your pot still. Okay, the, the anything that's triple distilled is 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 the same cutoffs really. Um, first distillation is is everything goes through to the you know producing low wines. Then we 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 cut it. Thirty percent is the kind of key cut. So in the second distillation, our strong faints. Uh, are above thirty percent, and their weak faints are below thirty. So the strong faints go forward to the third distillation, and then in in the spirit distillation, it, it's a similar thing. You've got four shots run for a bit, then you're catching spirit, which is around about eighty percent mark. Uh, finishes up around about seventy eight percent spirit cut, so it's quite a high cut. Then you collect strong faints down to thirty, and then weak faints from thirty down. So. Thirty so percent is the kind of magic number. And how does that differ to the pot still and the peat? Uh, the pot still and the peat. The peat was the only is the only difference. It was double distillation. Um, so I we I stuck with the the same cut points that I used at Glen Murray for that. Um, to, and that that did seem to to work pretty mm. well. So. Mentioning Glen Murray again, obviously one of the big controversial whiskies that you put out over at Glen Murray was your cider cask. Um, are you allowed to do a cider cask now you're at Dingle? I've, I've got a little bit of the work in progress. Uh, I, I've got in contact with a uh, cider uh, producer uh, up near Dublin and they've got half a dozen casks there that they're uh, putting cider in, the put cider into just now. It's been about six months, so I think uh, he, another month, and the, those casks will become available. So they'll come back to Dingle. So hopefully, yeah, we'll see something. And I think with the triple distilled single malt, especially, that I think it's something that could, that could and should work well. Mm. Also, the, the sweet spot for Glen Murray in the cider cask was around about eight years, eight to ten years. That that was the kind kind of the balance. Anything older was just too far gone. Uh, yeah. It needs to be kind of light and fresh to accentuate the, those flavours, not not too heavy, you know. So mm. I mean, yeah, I, no, 
Yeah, I've always felt with triple di uh, distilled whiskies, especially that it's that refill bourbon cask that really gives you the sweet spot and gives you it allows the spirit to sing, sort of thing. Um, but obviously, like you're saying at the moment, I suppose you're really on first fills most because if you're not putting out a lot of whiskey, then you're not emptying those first fills, so you won't no. really got much second fill there. Nothing to compare with at the moment. We've got a little bit of second fill. Uh, you know, we're probably around about ten percent of what we're what we're back for, what we're filling into cask is is second fill. Mm. I've set up a, a wood policy here where we're going to we're going to be first fill right up to twelve year old. Uh, anything second fill will uh, earmark for anything that's older than that at the moment. So uh, yeah. that's you know, and that that will keep us hopefully you know that that would definitely keep the quality up because. It, uh, certainly wouldn't be many still that could uh, stick with a policy like that but uh, that's that's where we're heading at the moment so i mean one of the other sort of things that is being banded around ireland at the moment is the 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 need to use all irish barley i mean obviously we know you're now bringing in the peat from england um how do you see do, do you think it's important to use irish barley on irish whiskey same as scottish barley on scottish and like we're looking at for english barley for english or do you just think it's a case of getting the best barley you possibly can to make the best spirit you possibly can to give out the best whiskey you can i think well for dingle everything else is 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 irish sourced so the, the irish barley um with two suppliers for malted barley so i know i think it's it's important that you that you, you try and take it from your doorstep if you can just from a logistical point of view and an environmental point of view uh, you know you don't want to be driving raw materials uh, from country to country and so and also you you, you want to support your, your your industry within your own your own country if you can um ireland are they're, they're very passionate here about about using irish produce and even you know when you buy you go to the supermarket you go to Lidl or or wherever the bottom of the the till receipt tells you how much of that or how much of what you bought was Irish produced so so it is something you can see why they're a bit more passionate maybe about it or mm. as passionate about it here uh, you know buying 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 Irish is a, is, is, is is definitely a, a thing that's encouraged here yeah, I mean, that's interesting, you know, that that certainly is something to look, you know, that could be pushed out a lot more then. But um, so so what barley are you using at the moment? Are you on Concerto or Lorette or? We're on the uh, Laureate, yeah, Sorry. just now, yeah. And is, is that for the pot still as well? Yes, yeah. same, same style, same, same spec, uh, same supplier for, for both. There's nothing... Um, with the pot still, um, you're allowed to add enzymes to the pot still because the, there isn't the, the enzyme activity in there enough. So, so as long as they're naturally produced enzymes, you can add them in uh, yeah. to, to help the, the unmalted uh, yeah. bit. So, along. I mean, obviously, over on social media over the last sort of few weeks, certainly noticed a lot more buzz about Dingle and, and releases coming out. So, so what is is there actually any whiskies? currently available other than in Ireland or is it just are you only just starting to get them out now we're 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 our domestic market which we we would call Ireland and, and the UK you know we're, we're pretty strong there we've we've got a batch five single malt release which was uh, released earlier this year and we also have a pot still third third release which is available we're heading towards a, a fourth release pot still towards the end this year uh, it's smaller quantities again. Single malt is bigger quantities, uh, but but you can you can you can you can track them down. Uh, hopefully, uh, but well, it will become easier. As I say, the the batch releases or the or the quantity of whiskey that we should sell by bottle probably will double in the next year. Hopefully, double in the next year. So mm -hmm. so yeah, with volume you can then tap into other markets. Um, we're strong in the US as well. Obviously, you know, Dingle has lots of connections uh, with with the US. So we're well, twenty five percent of our sales are, are in the US for the single malt. 
and Potstill will get there probably early next year for the first time. Right. And so anybody that hasn't tried your malt, what would you say the profile of that is? So I, I take it we're looking at a vatting of bourbon and sherry casks or, you know, does it, I, you know, is the intention to bring out, say, an old bourbon release, an old sherry release, or is it always going to be a bit of a mixture? I don't know. I think, you know, the, 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 the mixing of casks has been, has been really to help the, the younger spirit because, you know, it, even at the, you know, f it, well, four or five, six year old, there's no one single cask on its own that, that, that well, my opinion is, is rounded enough to, 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 to release. So when you combine bourbon with sherry and, and add in port or Madeira, you're getting the best of, of, of from each cask type and they, they help each other along. But as we go, Towards double figures in age, then I think we'll we'll see, you know, you will see a, a bourbon cask release on its own and, mm. and sherry on its own because they, they then can can stand up on their own and people quite rightly want to to taste the the, the you know the the cask and, and and enjoy what what it gives and you can also then really see what the the dingle character is like. Mm. I mean, obviously. We know the Irish whiskey scene is, is, is actually starting to get quite a big resurgence at the moment. And obviously, you know, Dingle's now getting a, a larger profile, especially on social media. You've got sort of the bonders like JJ Corey. You've obviously got Waterford causing a lot of um, stir in the... But where, where do you see the future of Irish whiskey? Do you, do you see it as something that's just going to have a little corner in the marketplace or do you actually see it becoming another big sort of player in the world whiskey scene i think it, it certainly could become a big player you know it, m many of the mature markets uh, especially you know like the us is, is obviously the irish connections there are very strong so i do think there's the chance that you know irish whiskey will come back to to much bigger volumes there's over 30 new distilleries now in, in Ireland that are producing or, or just about to produce. So, you know, a concern, especially at this time, you know, that hopefully all of those will survive and, and get a foothold. But it, 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 it's, it's the tricky business out there. You'll know yourself, you know, it's, there's a lot of competition and uh, it's just trying to get that niche that you, you, you get yourself in. And, you know, Dingle, we're a bit fortunate because we're, we're ahead of those of that new crowd mm. so we have that 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 is a is a big advantage to us but but you can't just always rely on that so, so and dingle will never be a massive distillery it's it's a small shed basically uh, it was an old sawmill so we're not we're never going to go uh, to big volumes so whatever we do we need to kind of do it do it right and and, and you know, get 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 a customer base that that follows us and stays with us yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's uh, when you look at some distilleries and you think, yeah, you need to increase your capacity because you're getting bigger in, in the marketplace. But then sometimes you kind of think it's better to plod along and keep that core customer range rather than go bigger. But I mean, so you say it's never going to be a big sort of producer, but is there scope to improve the capacity or is it always going to be at what you're at now? No, I think. It, you know, with with what we've got and where we could, we could we could probably treble capacity, um, maybe even quadruple capacity, which sounds a lot, but it's not. You know, we would still be under the million liters even if we if we uh, if went down that route. But that certainly is not imminent. You know, uh, maybe a little bit more production uh, capacity in the next two three years would, would probably be become useful because you do have to have a certain volume to to be able to compete on the world market and to and to to get into markets that you want to be you can't go in there just with a, a, a few bottles and, and try and sell them you need you know there is a, a scale that you need to be just to to get through all the all the hassles of distribution and everything else uh, mm. so so yeah it's, it's there's a fine line there and it's it, 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 you know it, it will be it's difficult and uh, you know, there are lots of whiskies out there now, lots of countries producing whiskey, so you can't just uh, rest on your laurels. And, but, uh, 
no, it's, it's, it's exciting times anyway. Um, Jens is asking as well, can you triple capacity without expanding your stills, your number of stills? Uh, we could double uh, capacity. Double. Um, double. We yeah. need another set of stills for to go beyond that. And obviously more mashing fermentation. But, yep. uh, um, and then Suzanne's now asking, do you plan to do an age statement release anytime soon? Yeah, again, I think we're heading very close to that. We're, we're, we're heading into, the, we're in our eighth year now. Well, maybe the, you know, the magic 10 would be, it's certainly be nice to see that, that number on, on a dingle bottle because uh, you know, we'll, we'll then have made it really into the, the mature side of things and the age mm -hmm. statement side. Uh, but I don't think we'll be too precious about age statements in particular because the, they, they kind of have uh, died away a little bit, you know, and with the flurry of non-age statements over the last few years, I think people have realised there's, there's more to it than just a, a couple of digits on the bottle label. Mm. You, you well, that, get, yeah, I mean, I was just about to say that because obviously at Glen Murray you had a very, very good young aged whiskey that was in the supermarkets. Um, is that something you're kind of looking at maybe in, in Ireland that you put a no age statement trying to get it into the supermarkets or do you just not have the capacity to really go that way? We're, we're probably not, uh, we're probably not that big to, to hit the big supermarket chains. You know, you, you have local chains in Ireland, which we are in, uh, in, in some of them. So we're, we, we, we have a, a degree of scale there, but uh, I think we're, we're not quite there to, to take on the, the big chains, you know. Mm. And Andy is asking, do you use a dry or a wet yeast? We use a dry yeast, yeah. We use uh, five kilos per, per, per mash, per washback. So we haven't got the volume to, to justify cream yeast. Um, I don't think there's a cream yeast in, in Ireland yet, uh, which is interesting, but uh, it's certainly... Uh, you know, I remember bringing cream yeast into Glenfiddich, and that was early two thousands. Mm. It, it was seen as a major, a major thing then. You know, not to get these bags of yeast and throw them in. Uh, I mean, but, that, that's certainly an interesting one because I know we've we've had a few people on and sort of speaking to a few of us in the industry, and it's a very contentious issue with yeast because some people are saying they don't understand why people wouldn't use a dry yeast, and then other people are saying everyone should be moving on from dry yeast to these liquid yeast. So, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. I, I think you used liquid at Glen Murray, didn't you? We had liquid there from, again, I, I introduced that probably 2006, 2007. I mean, the, the main reason for that was you were moving away from, from bagged yeast, which was, there was a manual handling aspect. And, you know, you, there were 20, 25 kilo bags and, mm. uh, you know, you, Glen Murray, you're probably using a hundred odd bags a week, so so it was there was a manual handle aspect and also a quality aspect as well. The bags didn't keep as well uh, as, as as the liquid does. You know, it's freshly delivered; it never sees the light of day, and it's in, always get chilled. So um, that was uh, interesting to use, but, but yeah, dry yeast was it's maybe better now than it was then. Um, Certainly, you know, there's quite a few people supplying it, and it, it, it's not too tricky to use. We just throw it straight into the washback here. We've got 72 hour fermentation, so there's plenty of time for it to, to get acclimatized and start working. Yeah, I was just about to ask you what your fermentation time is, and you put it in there. So, so 72 hours, which is kind of almost smack bang in the middle of as, as an average. Um, have you played around with fermentation at all, or is it something you're looking at doing, or are you just going to leave where it is? I don't think we'd play with it. You know, it works with our work schedule um, to keep that 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 three day fermentation. Uh, the washbacks are nicely settled at the end. They just they distills well in the wash still. So, so no no real plan to mm. um, to change. And then, to be honest, we're not set up to play around with fermentation things too much. It would be we would lose probably more production than we, we gained. So, I mean, one thing, yeah, one thing that kind of just comes to me now then, so 
Does the fermentation length of time make any difference when you're triple distilling it as much as it does with double distillation or, you know, because obviously when you triple, you're kind of getting a lighter florally spirit anyway. So does that longer fermentation help with that or does it not quite make as much difference? Um, probably the, the, the two go hand in hand, really. You know, you, the longer fermentation tends to give you the floral estuary. Mm character so uh, which is then um, when you triple distill you, it's you're accentuating that at the end so maybe the two two go together it might not be so clever to do a short fermentation and then triple distill you, you, you'll try maximize your floral estuary character first and then try and uh, maximize that in the final spirit as well mm. and sort of one question that's coming in is obviously distillation time so does that, obviously it will differ because you're doing triple distillation. What sort of distillation times have you got compared to your triple, compared to your double distillations then? Yeah, distillation is, the rate is the same all the time, um, no matter what. Uh, so we don't, um, uh, well, it's the same distillation rate on spirit as it is on uh, four shots or faints. So it's slow, slow distillation all the way, um, which is, you know, I'm used to seeing that you, you know, once you're on faint, you, you drive off, you double the, the, the flow rate, the distillate. But for, for Dingle, it, uh, the whole distillation is done at the slow spirit rate rather than uh, pushing it on. So, so that, that helps, you know. I think the slower you can distill, the better. Get, get more copper contact and, and uh, you know, less chance of anything carrying over in the in the vapor that you, you don't want to to have so uh, yeah it's got quite a laid back approach really <laughs> yeah i'm just looking here jens is asking not sure why he wants to know this but do you live in a on site or have you got a house in the suburbs um i'm not sure <laughs> if he's planning a trip to the warehouses just trying to find out what security uh, is up there if it's the jens that i know he's he's fishing yeah. for something he's he's uh, yeah, no, we, we live right next door to the distillery, so uh, it's, it's a slightly longer commute than I had at Glen Murray, but, but not much. <laughs> yeah, an extra, an extra few minutes, is it? Yeah, and you can get absolutely soaked here in the two minutes it takes to get there if the rain's in the, the wrong direction. We're, there's yeah. nothing between us and, and the east coast of America. No, yeah, well, that's it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think Ireland's quite well known for its four seasons in a day type thing, so... Um, yeah. But yeah, it's very interesting. But so obviously, like you know, we, we're obviously talking a lot about the triple because that's what you're doing. Does that make your job easier or harder? The fact that you are now coming to kind of a totally new regime to what you've been used to and treating that spirit a little bit differently. Then, yeah, I think I think as I said, the distillery is is evolving at the moment. So any preconceived ideas or thoughts I had, I've got to kind of push them out of the way and just, just learn with what's, what's going on. So, uh, uh, and I said, we're just at that interesting time, I say, where the, the different cask types are, are, are coming through at, at different rates and, uh, and I say, single malt versus pot still is, is another thing to, to keep an eye on. So, that, that, yeah, it's interesting. It's always good to be learning, you know, nothing worse than things being predictable and and uh, yeah. it's it's fine to, to have a few surprises now and again and are you maturing mostly on site or do you mature off site we mature on site well we've got a warehouse which is a mile away from the distillery building itself in the first few years the the casks were stored in the distillery but uh, obviously we we outgrew that and now we've we've got a good a good warehouse uh, it was going to be a, a DIY store. Unfortunately, that that crumbled. So we we inherited their their warehouse, uh, and it's a it's a great building. It's insulated as well. So, so temperature wise, we don't get the, the high peaks in the summer with the direct sunlight, and, and also in the winter, you know, Dingle's pretty mild climate, so uh, unlikely to drop below five degrees here. So maturation is is quicker than than I would say. I'm used to it at Glen Murray where, you know, a couple of months of the year you could you could really just have nothing happen. 
mm. whereas here it's it's mild all year round, so it's, so it's a good steady maturation. So I'm assuming if you're going into a new warehouse that's of some size, that'll be racked. Are the warehouses at the distillery Dunnage or are they all racked? We've got a bit of a bit of everything. There's two two buildings joined together. Um, one's lower roof than the other, so we have a bit of Dunnage style in in, in it, and then we have some racked as well and we have some palletized so we've got, mm. we've got everything in there right so sort of on, on a last note for the recording side of things if you had to summarize the difference between dingle and the other distilleries in ireland what would you say sets you apart from the others um, apart from yourself <laughs> apart from having a scotsman there i uh, i don't know that's uh, you kept the dif difficult question at the end I don't know. dingle is I think we're we're hopefully we're 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 ahead uh, of of the game, you know, in age terms. I, I would like to think we've got pretty much one of the best wood policies going, and with our first fill philosophy and the range of casks that we're filling. So, so hopefully with Dingle, that you know, if you do ever buy a Dingle, you know, the quality of the glass in the bottle will speak for itself. Um, so, anybody got any final questions before I stop the recording? You go on, Andy. Hand up. That's the point. Yeah, there you go. Hand up. I'm polite, mate. You know what I mean? Um, firstly, I agree. How are you doing, mate? Um, so, you, you've kind of touched on over the course of the, the, the last uh, 40 minutes or so around, um, you know, obviously where you get your malt from, uh, the PPM of your peated spirit and things like that. And obviously you've got a nice mix of casks there already but for you where, where do you see the main sort of area for experimentation over the next sort of five to ten years is it going to be in your casks or are you going to be sort of maybe mixing up your your peated levels or what what for you is the first avenue that you're really going to kind of concentrate on for sort of uh, experimentation yeah i think you know i think the cask casks will you'll always will always everybody will experiment with them uh, you have yeah. to have a kind of core uh, a core set of casks that you need to fill and, and so that you can have consistency in the future but you also have to have something a little bit different to appeal i think for me there's 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 rumblings on the pot still side where uh, we'll maybe be able to use different well a, a higher percentage of, of non uh, malted cereals so the rye and the oats at the moment you can only use five percent of them and uh, uh, there's a feeling that that doesn't really match what, what would have been done in the past. So, so I think if that opens up, then there's there's a lot to do there, and uh, and and also you you know, say play around with the the peated side of things, maybe do a bit more double distillation as well. Dingle just just uh, you know we're of a size where we can we can flex around and do different things quite easily. We're not a big big ship that we need to steer too hard. You know, it was easy. We jumped from sing, uh, from triple distillation to double distillation in a day. Uh, uh, the distillery was set up with the help of John McDougall, who's the Scotsman, and uh, there's a lot of double distillation sizing going on. So it's actually a distillery, our, like our, our first, our low wine still and our spirit still are perfect size for double distillation. Mm. Uh, and the tanks below worked as well. So that's uh, yeah, definitely an influence there stuff i suppose that's the beauty of being a small operation still isn't it you've got that kind of flexibility to be able to kind of do what you want to at some extent without having to go up the chain to a, a holding company or a parent company to kind of like test the waters about releases and things like that no and we're currently looking into um uh, possibly trying to do a little bit of rum as well so that's that's another uh, little bit of fun we'll have hopefully in the next week while so yeah, we, we've got scope to do do different things. We say family owned Dingles, a family owned uh, distillery. So I think that always helps. That you know, I worked with uh, Glenn Fiddick, who was family owned, and, and even La Martini Kez is family owned. Uh, you you get a much longer term view with 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 that kind of ownership. I mean, one thing that I always look at going back again to the triple distillation side is I when, whenever I have a a triple distillation whiskey i always kind of look at it as a breakfast job and you kind of 
it is is your spirit going to be that lightness um you know that that we class like that or is it going to be a little bit more heavier and yeah. how does the pot still come out does that come out heavier or not yeah the dingle stills are, are small they're not you know they're not big stills um, so they do they do have an inherent kind of heavy heavier oiliness about the the spirit and that that is obviously there in the, the pot still as well with the the creaminess so so you know you know i wouldn't say dingles are light a light light spirit it does hold up pretty well to you know to different cask types and we'll see how that goes in the future years but but I think Dingle in a bourbon cask will be something really worth having in the next yeah. few years. So anybody got any questions while we're recording them? We'll obviously go into the hot topic once we stop. So I don't want to put that on record at the moment. Um, no, everybody quite happy where we are. 